Chapter 4 Bankrolling the Bolshevik Revolution The establishing of the Federal Reserve System provided the conspiracy with an instrument whereby the international bankers could run the national debt up to the sky, thereby collecting enormous amounts of interest and also gaining control over the borrower. During the Wilson administration alone, the national debt expanded 800%. Two months prior to the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, the conspirators had created a mechanism to collect the funds to pay the interest on the national debt. That mechanism was the progressive income tax, the, the second plank of, the, of Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, which contained ten planks for socializing a country. One quite naturally assumes that the graduated income tax would be opposed by the wealthy. The fact is that many of the wealthiest Americans supported it. Some no doubt out of altruism and because at first the taxes were very small, but others backed the scheme because they already had a plan for permanently avoiding both the income tax and the subsequent inheritance tax. What happened was this. At the turn of the century, the populists, a group of rural socialists, were gaining strength and challenging the power of the New York bankers and monopolist industrialists. While the populists had the wrong answers, they asked many of the right questions. Unfortunately, they were led to believe that the banker monopolist control over government, which they opposed, was a product of free enterprise. Since the populist threat to the cartelists was from the left, there being no organized political movement for la laissez-faire, the insiders moved to capture the left. Professor Quigley disclosed that over 50 years ago, the Morgan firm decided to infiltrate the left-wing political movement in the United States. This was no difficult to this was not difficult to do since these left groups needed funds and were eager for help to get their message to the public. Wall Street supplied both. There was nothing new about this decision, says Quigley, since other financiers had talked about it and even attempted it earlier, he continues. What makes it decisively important this time was the combination of its adoption by the dominant Wall Street financier at a time when tax policy was driving all financiers to seek tax exempt refuges for their fortunes. Radical movements are never successful unless they attract big money and or outside support. The great historian of the 20th century, Oswald Spengler, was one of those who saw that what American liberals refused to see, that the left is controlled by its alleged enemy, the malefactors of great wealth. He wrote in his monumental Decline of the West, there is no proletarian, not even a communist m movement, that has not operated in the interest of money, in the direction indicated by money, and for the time being permitted by money, and that without the idealists among its leaders having the slightest suspicion of the fact. While the populist movement was basically non-conspiratorial, its leftist ide ideology and platform were made to order for the elitist insiders because it aimed at concentrating power in government. The insiders knew they could control that power and use it to their own purposes. They were not, of course, interested in promoting competition but in restricting it. Professor Gabriel Kolko has prepared a lengthy volume presenting the undeniable proof that the giant corporate ma manipulators promoted much of the so-called progressive legislation of the Roosevelt and Wilson era legislation, which ostensibly was aimed at controlling their abuses, but which was so written as to suit their interests, and the triumph of conservatism, by which Kolko mistakenly means big business, he notes, the significant reason for many businessmen welcoming and working to increase federal intervention into their affairs has been virtually ignored by historians and economists. The oversight was due to the illusion that American industry was centralized and monopolized to such an extent that it could rationalize the activity, regulate production and prices in its various branches voluntarily. Quite the opposite was true. Despite the large number of mergers and the growth of the absolute size of many corporations, the dominant tendency in the American economy at the beginning of the century was toward growing competition. Competition was unacceptable to many key businesses and financial interests. The best way for the insiders to eliminate this growing competition was to impose a progressive income tax on their competitors while writing the law so as to include built-in escape hatches for themselves. Actually, very few of the proponents of the graduated income tax realized they were playing into the hands of those they were seeking to control. As Ferdinand Lundberg notes in The Rich and the Super Rich, what if the income tax became, finally, 
was a siphon gradually inserted into the pocketbooks of the general public, imposed the popular huzzas as a class tax. The income tax was gradually turned into a mass tax in a jiu-jitsu turnaround. The insider's principal mouthpiece in the Senate during this period was Nelson Aldrich, one of the conspirators involved in engineering the creation of the Federal Reserve and the maternal grandfather of Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. Lundberg says that when Aldrich spoke, a newsman understood that although the words were his, the dramatic line was surely approved by a big John D. Rockefeller. In earlier years, Aldrich was, had denounced the income tax as communistic and socialistic, but in 1909, he pulled a dramatic and stunning reversal. The American Biographical Dictionary comments, just when the opposition had become formidable, he, Aldrich, took the wind out of its sails by bringing forward, with the support of President Taft, a proposed amendment to the Constitution empowering Congress to lay income taxes. Howard Hinton records in his biography of Cordial Hall that Congressman Hall, who had been pushing in the House for the income tax, wrote this stunned observation. During the past few weeks, the unexpected spectacle of certain so-called old-line conservative Republican leaders in Congress suddenly reversing their attitude of a lifetime and seemingly espousing through ill-concealed reluctance the proposed income tax amendment to the Constitution has been the occasion of universal surprise and wonder. The escape hatch for the insiders to avoid paying taxes was ready. By the time the amendment had been approved by the states, even before the income tax was passed, the Rockefellers and Carnegie Foundations were in full operation. One must remember that it was to break up the Standard Oil, Rockefeller, and U.S. Steel, Carnegie, monopolies that the various antitrust acts were ostensibly passed. These monopolists now could now compound their wealth tax-free, while competitors had to face a graduated income tax, which made it difficult to amass capital. As we have said, socialism is not a share the wealth program, as the socialists would like you to believe, but to consolidate and control the wealth program for the insiders. The Reese Committee, which investigated foundations for Congress in 1953, proved with an overwhelming amount of evidence that the various Rockefeller and Carnegie foundations have been promoting socialism since their inception. The conspirators now had created the mechanisms to run up the debt, to collect the debt and for themselves to avoid the taxes required to pay the yearly interest on the debt. Then all that was needed was a reason to escalate the debt. Nothing runs up a national debt like a war, and World War I was being brewed in Europe. In 1916, Woodrow Wilson was re-elected by a hair. He had based his campaign on the slogan, He kept us out of war. The American public was extremely opposed to America's getting involved in a European war. Staying out of the perennial foreign quarrels had been an American tradition since George Washington. But as Wilson was stumping the country, giving his solemn word that American soldiers would not be sent into a foreign war, he was preparing to do just the opposite. His alter ego, as he called Colonel House, was making behind-the-scenes agreements with England, which committed America to entering the war. Just five months later, we were in it. The same crowd which manipulated the passage of the income tax in the Federal Reserve System wanted America in the war. J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, Colonel House, Jacob Schiff, Paul Warburg, and the rest of the Jekyll Island conspirators were all deeply involved in getting us in involved. Many of these financiers had loaned England large sums of money. In fact, J.P. Morgan and co. served as British financial agents in this country during World War I. While all of the standard reasons given for the outbreak of World War I in Europe doubtless were factors, there were also other more important ca causes. The conspiracy had been planning the war for over two decades. The assassination of an Austrian Archduke was merely an incident providing an excuse for starting a chain reaction. After years of fighting, the, the war was a complete stalemate and would have ended almost immediately in a negotiated settlement, as had most other European conflicts, had not the U.S. declared war on Germany. As soon as Wilson's re-election had been engineered through the, the He Kept Us Out of War slogan, a complete reversal of propaganda was instituted. In those days, before radio and television, public opinion was controlled almost exclusively by newspapers. 
Many of the major newspapers were controlled by the Federal Reserve crowd. Now that they began beating the drums over the inevitability of war, Arthur Ponsonby, a member of the British Parliament, admitted in his book, Falsehood in Wartime, there must have been more deliberate lying in the world from 1914 to 1918 than in any other period of the world's history. Propaganda concerning the war was heavily one-sided, although after the war many historians admitted that one side was as guilty as the other in starting the war, Germany was pictured as a militaristic monster which wanted to rule the world. Remember this picture was painted by Britain, which had its soldiers in more countries around the world than all other nations put together. So-called Prussian militarism did exist, but it was no threat to conquer the world. Meanwhile, the sun never set on the British Empire. Actually, the Germans were proving to be tough business com competitors in the world's markets, and the British did not approve. In order to generate war fever, the sinking of the Lusitania, a British ship torpedoed two years earlier, was revived and given renewed headlines. German submarines warfare was turned into a major issue by the newspapers. Submarine warfare was a phony issue. Germany and England were at war. Each was blockading the other country. J.P. Morgan and other financiers were selling munitions to Britain. The Germans could not allow those supplies to be delivered any more than the English would have allowed them to be delivered to Germany. If Morgan wanted to take the risks and reap the rewards, or suffer the consequences, of selling munitions to England, that was his business. It was certainly nothing over which the entire nation should have been dragged into war. The Lusitania, at the time it was sunk, was carrying six million pounds of ammunition. It was actually illegal for American passengers to be aboard a ship carrying munitions of two belligerents. Almost two years before the liner was sunk, the New York Tribune, June 19, 1913, carried a squib which stated, Canard officials acknowledged to the Tribune correspondent today that the Greyhound, Lusitania, is being equipped with high-power naval rifles. In fact, the Lusitania was registered in the British Navy as an auxiliary cruiser. In addition, the government, the German government took out large ads in all the New York papers warning potential passengers that the ship was carrying munitions and telling them not to cross the Atlantic on it. Those who chose to make the trip knew the risk they were taking. Yet the sinking of the Lusitania was used by clever propagandists to portray the Germans as inhuman slaughterers of innocents. Submarine warfare was manufactured into a cause celebre to push us into war. On April 6, 1917, Congress declared war. The American people acquiesced on the basis that it would be a war to end all wars. During the war to end all wars, insider banker Bernard Baruch was made absolute dictator over American business when President Wilson appointed him chairman of the War Industries Board, where he had control of all domestic contracts for Allied war materials. Baruch made lots of friends while placing tens of billions in government contracts, and it was widely rumored in Wall Street that out of the war to make the world safe for international bankers, he netted $200 million for himself. While insider banker Paul Warburg controlled the Federal Reserve and international banker Bernard Baruch placed government contracts, international banker Eugene Mayer, a former partner of Baruch and the son of a partner in the Rothschild International Banking House of Lazad Ferez, was Wilson's choice to head the war finance corporation, where he made a little money. Footnote. Mayer later gained control of the highly influential Washington Post, which became known as the Washington Daily Worker. It should be noted that Sir William Wiseman, the man sent by British intelligence to help bring the United States into the war, was amply rewarded for his services. He stayed in the country after World War I as the new partner in the Jacob Schiff Paul Warburg controlled Kuhn Loeb Bank. World War I was a financial bonanza for the international bankers. But it was a catastrophe of such magnitude for the United States that few even today grasp its importance. The war reversed our traditional foreign policy of non-involvement and we have been enmeshed almost constantly ever since in perpetual wars for perpetual peace. Winston Churchill once observed that all nations would have been better off had the U.S. minded its own business. Had we done so, he said, peace would have been made with Germany and there would have been no collapse in Russia leading to communism. No breakdown of government in Italy, followed by fascism, and Nazism would never have gained ascendancy in Germany. The Bolshevik Revolution in Russia 
was obviously one of the great turning points in world history. It is an event over which misinformation abounds. The mythmakers and rewriters of history have done their landscape painting jobs well. The establishing of communism in Russia is a classic example of the second big lie of communism, that it is the movement of the downtrodden masses rising up against exploiting bosses. This cunning deception has been fostered since before the first French Revolution in 1789. Most people today believe the communists were successful in Russia because they were able to rally behind them the sympathy and frustration of the Russian people, who were sick of the tyranny of the Tsars. This is to ignore the history of what actually happened. While well, almost everybody is reminded that the Bolshevik Revolution took place in November of 1917, few knew that the Tsar had abdicated seven months earlier in March. When Tsar Nicholas II abdicated, a provisional government was established by Prince Lvov, who wanted to pattern the new go Russian government after our own. But, unfortunately, the Lvov government gave way to the Kerensky regime. Kerensky, Kerensk a so-called democratic socialist, may have been running a caretaker government for the communists. He kept the war going against Germany and the other central powers. But he issued a general amnesty for communists and other revolutionaries many of whom have been exiled after the abortive Red Revolution of 1905. Back to Mother Russia came 250,000 dedicated revolutionaries, and Kerensky's own government's doom was sealed. In the Soviet Union, as in every communist country, or as they call themselves, the socialist countries, the power has not come to the communist hands because the downtrodden masses willed it so. The power had come from the top down in every instance, Let's briefly, briefly reconstruct the sequences of the communist takeover. The year is 1917. The Allies are fighting the Central Powers. The Allies include Russia, the British Commonwealth, France, and by April 1917, the United States. In March of 1917, purposeful planners set in motion the forces to compel Tsar Nicholas II to abdicate. He did so under pressure from the Allies after severe riots in the Tsarist capital of Petrograd. Riots that were caused by the breakdowns in the transportation system which cut the city off from food supplies and led to the closing of factories. But where were Lenin and Trotsky when all this was taking place? Lenin was in Switzerland and had been in Western Europe since 1905 when he was exiled for trying to topple the Tsar in the abortive communist revolution of that year. Trotsky also was in exile, a reporter for a communist newspaper of the Lower East Side of New York City. The Bolsheviks were not a vis visible political force at the time the Tsar called them abdicated, and they came to power not because the downtrodden masses of Russia called them back, but because very powerful men in Europe and the United States sent them in. Lenin was sent across Europe at war on the famous sealed train. With him, Lenin took some five to six million in gold. The whole thing was arranged by the German High Command and Mar Max Warburg through another very wealthy and lifelong socialist by the name of Alexander Helfand, alias Parvis. When Trotsky left New York aboard the SS Christi Christiania on March 27, 1917, with his entourage of 275 revolutionaries, the first port was called Halifax, Nova Scotia. There the Canadians grabbed Trotsky and his money and impounded them both. This was a very logical thing for the Canadian government to do, for Trotsky had said many times that if he was successful in coming to power in Russia, he would immediately stop what he called the imperialist war and sue for a separate peace of Germany. This would free millions of German troops for transfer from the Eastern Front to the Western Front, where they could kill Canadians. So Trotsky cooled his heels in a Canadian prison for five days. Then all of a sudden the British, through future Cohen Lua partner Sir William Wiseman in the United States, through none other than the ubiquitous Colonel House pressured the Canadian government and, despite the fact we were now in the war, said in so many words, let Trotsky go. Thus, with an American passport, Trotsky went back to meet Lenin. They joined up, and by November, through bribery, cunning, brutality, and deception, they were able not to bring the masses rallying to their cause, but to hire enough thugs and make enough deals to impose out of the gun barrel what Lenin called all power to the Soviets. The communists came to power by seizing a mere handful of key cities. In fact, practically the whole Bolshevik Revolution took place in one city, Petrograd. It was as if the whole United States became communist because the communist-led mobs seized Washington, D.C. It was years before the Soviets solidified power throughout Russia. 
The Germans, on the face of it, had a plausible excuse for financing Lenin and Trotsky. The two Germans most responsible for the financing of Lenin were Max Warburg and a displaced Russian named Alexander Helfand. They could claim that they were serving their country's cause by helping and financing Lenin. However, these two German patriots neglected to mention to the Kaiser their plan to foment a communist revolution in Russia. The picture takes on another dimension when you consider that the brother of Max Warburg was Paul Warburg, prime mover in establishing the Federal Reserve System, and who, from his position on the Federal Reserve Board of Directors, played a key role in financing the American war effort. When news leaked out in American papers about Brother Max running the German finances, Paul resigned from his Federal Reserve post without a whimper. From here on, the, the plot, plot sickens. For the father-in-law of Max Warburg's brother, Felix, was Jacob Schiff Sr., partner in Kuhn, Loeb, and Co. Paul and Felix Warburg, you will recall, were also partners in Kuhn, Loeb, and Co., while Max ran the Rothschild Allied Family Bank of Frankfurt. Jacob Schiff also helped finance Leon Trotsky. According to the New York Journal, American of uh, February 3, 1949, today it is estimated by Jacob's grandson, John Schiff, that the old man sank about $20 million for the final triumph of Bolshevism in Russia. One of the best sources of information on financing the Bolshevik Revolution is Tsarism and the revolution by an important white Russian general named Ars Arsene de Golovich, who was founder in France of the Union of Oppressed Peoples. In this volume, written in French and subsequently translated in English, de Golovich notes, The main purveyors of funds for the revolution, however, were neither the crackpot Russian millionaires nor the armed bandits of Lenin. The real money primarily came from certain British and American circles, which for a long time past had lent their support to the Russian revolutionary cause. De Golovich continues, the important part played by the wealthy American banker, Jacob Schiff, and the events in Russia, though as yet only partially revealed, is no longer a secret. General Alexander Nekvolodov is quoted by Degolovich as stating in his book on the Bolshevik Revolution. In April 1917, Jacob Schiff publicly declared that it was thanks to his financial support that the revolution in Russia had succeeded. In the spring of the same year, Schiff commenced to subsidize Trotsky. Simultaneously, Trotsky and Co. were being subsidized by Max Warburg and Olaf Ashberg of the Nye Bank of Stockholm, the Rhine Westphalian Syndicate, and Jivotovsky, Jivo whose daughter later married Trotsky. Jacob Schiff spent millions to overthrow the Tsar and more millions to overthrow Kerensky. He was lending money to Russia long after the true character of the Bolsheviks was known to the world. Schiff raised 10 million, supposedly for Jewish war relief in Russia, but later events revealed it to be a good business investment. According to De Golovich, Mr. Bakhmatiev, the late Russian imperial ambassador to the United States, tells us that the Bolsheviks, after victory, transferred 600 million rubles and gold between the year 1918 and 1922 to Kuhn, Loeb and Company, Schiff's firm. Schiff's participation in the Bolshevik Revolution, though quite naturally now denied, was well known among Allied intelligence services at the time. This led to much talk about Bolshevism being a Jewish plot. The result was that the subject of financing the communist takeover of Russia became taboo. Later evidence indicates that the bankrolling of the Bolsheviks was handled by a syndicate of international bankers, which in addition to the Schiff Warburg clique included Morgan and Rockefeller interests. Documents show that the Morgan organization put at least one million in the Red Revolutionary Kitty. Still, another important financier of the Bolshevik Revolution was an extremely wealthy Englishman named Lord Alfred Milner, the organizer, aide head of a secret organization called the Roundtable Group, which was backed by Lord Rothschild, discussed in the next chapter. Degolovich notes further, on April 7th, 1917, General Janin made the following entry in his diary. Long interview with R, who confirmed what I had previously been told by M, as we were referring to the, the, the German hatred of himself and his family, he turned to the subject of the revolution which, he claimed, was engineered by the English and more precisely by Sor Sir George Buchanan and Lord Alfred Milner. Petrograd at the time was teeming with English. 
He could, he asserted, name the streets and the numbers of the houses in which British agents were quartered. They were reported during their rising to have distributed money to the soldiers and incited them to mutiny. Degolovich goes on to reveal, in private interviews, I have been told that over 21 million rubles were spent by Lord Milner in financing the Russian Revolution. It should be noted parenthetically that Lord Milner, Paul, Felix, and Max Warburg represented their respective countries of the Paris Peace Conferences at the conclusion of World War I. We can somehow ascribe Max Warburg's financing of Lenin to German patriotism. It was certainly not patriotism which inspired Schiff, Morgan, Rockefeller, and Milner to bankroll the Bolsheviks. Both Britain and America were at war with Germany and were allies of Tsarist Russia. To free dozens of German divisions to switch from the Eastern Front to France and kill hundreds of thousands of American British soldiers was nothing short of treason. In the Bolshevik Revolution, we see many of the same old faces that, had, that were responsible for creating the Federal Reserve System, initiating the graduated income tax, setting up the tax-free foundations, and pushing us into World War I. However, if you conclude that this is anything but coincidental, your name will be immediately expunged from the social register. No revolution can be successful without organization and money. The downtrodden masses usually provide little of the former and none of the latter but insiders at the top can arrange for both. What did these people possibly have to gain in financing the Russian Revolution? What did they have to gain by keeping it alive and afloat, or, during the 1920s, by pouring millions of dollars into what Lenin called his new economic program, thus saving the Soviets from collapse? Why would these capitalists do all this? If your goal is global conquest, you have to start somewhere. It may or may not have been coincidental, but Russia was the one major European country without a central bank. In Russia, for the first time, the communist conspiracy gained a geographical homeland from which to launch assaults against the other nations of the world. The West now had an enemy. In the Bolshevik Revolution, we have some of the world's richest and most powerful men financing a movement which claims its very existence is based on the concept of stripping their wealth. Men like the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, Schiffs, Warburgs, Morgans, Harrimans, and Milners. But obviously these men have no fear of international communism. It is only logical to assume that if they financed it and do not fear it, it must be because they control it. Can there be any other explanation that makes sense? Remember that for over 150 years it had been standard operating procedures of the Rothschilds and their allies to control both sides of every conflict. You must have an enemy if you're going to collect from the king. The East-West balance of power politics is used as one of the main excuses for the socialization of America. Although it was not their main purpose, by nationalization of Russia, the insiders bought themselves an enormous piece of real estate, complete with mineral rights for somewhere between 30 and 40 million dollars. We can only theorize on the manner in which Moscow is controlled from New York, London, and Paris. Undoubtedly, much of the control is economic, but certainly the international bankers have an enforcer arm within Russia to keep Soviet leaders in line. The organization may be Smirsh, the international communist murder organization described in testimony before our congressional committees and by Ian Fleming in his James Bond books. For although the Bond novels were widely imaginative, Fleming had been in British Navy intelligence, maintained excellent intelligence contacts around the world, and was reputedly a keen student of the international conspiracy. We do know this, however, a clique of American financiers not only helped establish communism in Russia, but has striven mightily ever since to keep it alive. Ever since 1918, this clique has been engaged in transferring money, and probably more important, technical information to the Soviet Union. This is made absolutely clear in the three-volume history, Western Technology and Soviet Economic development by scholar Anthony Sutton of Stanford University's Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. Using, for the most part, official State Department documents, Sutton shows conclusively that virtually everything the Soviets po possess has been acquired from the West. It is not much of an exaggeration to say that the USSR was made in the USA. The landscape painters, unable to refute Sutton's monumental scholarship, simply paint him out of the picture. At Versailles, the same clique carved up Europe and set the stage for World, World War II. As Lord Curzon commented, It is not a peace treaty, it is simply a break in hostilities. In 1933, the same insiders pushed FDR into recognizing the Soviet Union, thus saving it from financial collapse. While at the same time, 
They were underwriting huge loans on both sides of the Atlantic for the new regime of Adolf Hitler. In so doing, they assisted Jet greatly in setting the stage for World War II and the events that followed. In 1941, the same insiders rushed to the aid of our noble ally Stalin after his break with Hitler. In 1943, these same insiders marched off to the Tehran Conference and proceeded to start the carving up of Europe after the Second Great War to end war. Again at Yalta and Potsdam in 1945, they established the China policy, later summarized by Owen Lattimore. The problem was how to allow them, China, to fall without making it look as if the United States had pushed them. The facts are inescapable. In one country after another, communism has been imposed on the local population from the top down. The most prominent forces for the imposition of that tyranny came from the United States and Great Britain. Here is a charge that no American enjoys making, but the facts lead to no other possible conclusion. The idea that communism is a movement of the downtrodden masses is a fraud. None of the foregoing makes sense if communism really is what the communists and the establishment tell us it is. But if communism is an arm of a bigger conspiracy to control the world by power-mad billionaires, and brilliant but ruthless academians who have shown them how to use their power, it all becomes perfectly logical. It is at this point that we should again make it clear that this conspiracy is not made up solely of bankers and international cartelists, but includes every field of human endeavor, starting with Voltaire and Adam Weishaupt and running through John Ruskin, Sidney Webb, Nicholas Murray Butler, and to the present with Henry Kissinger and John Kenneth Galbraith. It has always been the scholar looking for avenues of power who has shown the sons of the very powerful how their wealth could be used to rule the world. Do not stress too greatly the importance of the reader keeping in mind that this book is discussing only one segment of the conspiracy, certain international bankers, other equally important segments which work to foment labor, religious and racial strife in order to promote socialism have been described in numerous other books. These other divisions of the conspiracy operate independently of the international bankers in most ca cases, and it would certainly be disastrous to ignore the danger to our freedom they represent. It would be equally disastrous to lump all businessmen and bankers into the conspiracy. One must draw the distinction between competitive free enterprise, the most moral and productive system ever devised, and cartel capitalism dominated by industrial monopolists and international bankers. The difference is the private enterpriser operates by offering products and services in a competitive free market where the cartel capitalists uses the government to force the public to do business with them. These corporate socialists are the deadly enemies of competitive private enterprise. Liberals are willing to believe that these robber barons will fix prices, rig markets, establish monopolies, buy politicians, exploit employees, and fire them the day before they are eligible for pension, but they absolutely will not believe that these same men want, would want to rule the world or would use communism as a striking edge of their conspiracy. When one discusses the machinations of these men, liberals usually respond by saying, But don't you think they mean well? However, if you think with logic, reason, and precision in this field and try to expose these power seekers, the establishment's mass media will accuse you of being a dangerous paranoid who is dividing our people in every other area, of course. They encourage dissent as being healthy in a democracy.